of faith, the foundation of things hoped for. I uh, sometimes uh, confuse this event with the Project Plus 60 group that Given fired up here a few years ago. And uh, I failed to realize as I was putting this together that some of us are not chronologically advantaged, as a lot of us are. <laughs> yeah, boy, we're working at it all the time, aren't we, Fred? Bless your heart. Anyway, <clears throat> we, uh, we do appreciate having backed out of retirement, serving a congregation of people down in Green Valley, Arizona, most of whom are about our age. As a matter of fact, Jane is exactly the average age for Green Valley, Arizona. You can ask her what it is after a while if you want to. <laughs> uh, George Swan, who was a brother in Christ and a brother in the Restoration, put together a nifty translation of New, uh, New Testament Scripture. He spent, um, yeah, thanks, uh, Gail, for giving me the book I have along about 1938. No, 1948. No, it was later than that. It's become a loose-leaf Bible. <laughs> Not intended to be, but it is. Anyway, Brother Swan translated our text. Faith is a foundation of things hoped for. It is a means of proving unseen realities. Uh, Jane, who has been my buddy for 52 years, as of June 30, is going to pass around a, an agate. I want you to look at it and be sure I get it back when this is over. I don't care how much time it takes making the rounds, but I do want it back. A Darwinian geologist would estimate that it took maybe a million or a million and a half years to form. And this, believe me, is an exercise of faith. <laughs> now, you who are uh, looking at my agate right now, may wonder about that band of metal which closely encloses it. Well, there's a story about that. This came out of the plumbing of the Hotel Oxnard in Norfolk, Nebraska, and Jane and I were staying in that hotel about 52 years ago. Um, a million and a half years? At the most, we're looking at something that formed in the process of about 60 or 70 years. Regardless of who says otherwise, those are the facts. And it's great that in Christ we have facts to depend on. We don't have to wonder about hocus pocus. Amen. So uh, if an agate doesn't necessarily take a million and a half years ago, you know, when you have a timeline that's accurate, then you have something to go by. And that's what this wonderful book of Hebrews is all about, giving us a timeline. It's uh, ridiculous to have faith if your faith isn't at some point founded on verifiable fact. And we have that in this wonderful book. In proper scientific procedure, a statement is made, evidence is given to support it, and we have a whole bunch of wonderful case histories to show what happens when people take the evidence seriously. That's the book of Hebrews, and particularly this wonderful 11th chapter. Our brother George Swan renders the word hypostasis as foundation. And that's pretty good. It means literally what's on standing on something. And that's a, a good way to understand it. But I'm a little bit unhappy with it because a Christian virtue should not be just standing around. It should be an active thing. And uh, we, uh, shall we say we have enough people who just sort of stand around. Uh, they're there Sunday morning for the body count. And otherwise, they're not much good to anybody, and they may actually be getting in the way of people that really want to do things in the church. Shall we agree there? Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> He's the one that told me to do it, that he forgot why. 
<laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. All right, let's go on from there. Uh, we, we need a more, a more active definition of this word. Unfortunately, in this case and in many other cases in Scripture, contextual usages can provide us with all kinds of definition. Genau, for example, means both bear and beget. Begotten of the water, or begotten of the spirit, born of the water, same word. Um, about the neatest illustration of this is from John's Gospel, the fifth word, logos. It has three meanings. It means a word or a testimony. It means an argument. Whence we get logic. And it also means a demonstration. And uh, you guys, if you run short of inspiration sometime when you're getting ready for preparing a sermon, help yourself to that one. A three-pointer based on one word. Jesus is the final word of God. Amen. The second verse of Hebrews states that as emphatically as can be. God spoke to the fathers in times past by prophets. But in the end of those days, not in these last days with the time idea, because after all that was 2,000 years ago, but in the end of these days, he speaks through his son. No prophets are necessary since the time of Christ. That rules out Muhammad. It rules out Amy Simple McPherson, or should we say Simple Amy McPherson? Mary Baker, Glover, Patterson, Eddie, anybody else you care to think of. We don't need any of them because we have the Son of God as the final statement of God to man. Amen. And we have Jesus as the argument for God. Amen. And we have him as the demonstration of God. Amen. There's a lot there, guys. You put it together at your leisure. Uh, let's see. I, I intended to go along at some length on that, but I've made the point. When I was a kid in high school, uh, shortly after the Battle of Gettysburg was fought, <laughs> my mom saw that I had access to some wonderful books by Dr. Harry Rimmer. Any of you remember him? Yes. A man who had a doctorate in religion and in science. And oh, he gave some neat, some neat stuff. I'll bet those books are still worth reading. Although, uh, I've recently run into a better one, Gail. <laughs> The Signature of God by Grant Jeffries. If you haven't read that and you know about it, shame on you. Get it and read it. It's the dandiest uh, compendium of, of reasons for believing God's word you can imagine. But anyway, uh, from uh, Dr. Rimmer's books, and I don't remember which one, the wonderful illustration of this word, hypostasis. He told of archaeologists finding a small village in the Egyptian desert that had apparently been destroyed by bandits. And in the ruins of the village inn, they found the mummified body of a man who had died protecting an ivory box containing documents. They had to do with a lawsuit in the Roman court because the Romans were running Egypt back then like they ran just about everything else. And a woman named Dionysia was involved in a lawsuit. And by the hands of this man, she had sent to the Roman prefect a bunch of documents and a covering letter, including our word, hypostasis. This was her hypostasis. And Dr. Rimmer felt that this meant that faith was a title deed. And that's neat. It's not active, but it's neat. I'm not as happy with that as I used to be because I've used this illustration countless times. But uh, faith is the title deed to the mansion over the hilltop some of us sing about. And that, that's, that's nifty, it really is. But I don't like it too well because it isn't active enough. A title deed just sits there. It isn't going anywhere, it just sits there. And that's not a Christian virtue. The Christian had better be doing things. 
Well, there's another word that's uh, used in this passage. Now, let's see, before I get to that, I better, I, I better remember my good friend Harold Fox, who has never taught Greek in Bible college, but I think he knows more Greek than some Bible college professors. Uh, any, uh, any one present, of course, being an outstanding exception to that. <laughs> anyway, uh, Harold likes undertaking. Faith is the undertaking of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. And I like that pretty well, except that undertaking is one of the meanings of another word in that same passage. Uh, this is pragma. Happening, event, matter, thing, undertaking, task, dispute. It can even mean a lawsuit and is used in that sense in 1 Corinthians 6.1 where Paul scolds the Corinthians for indulging themselves in lawsuits. And then there's elinkos. And it also has some legal implications. To show fault, show error, to convince someone of his fault or error, reprove, condemn, prove guilty, so forth. I remember it from studying logic as refutation. And this is, uh, this is kind of a neat thing to keep in mind. I'm all in favor of Christians doing whatever they can, whenever they can, to refute the arguments that are given against the claims of Christ. I like that. That's what we ought to be doing. That's active, and that's good. Well, this uh, wide range of definition may, uh, may enter some of us who are told by our Greek professors how precise the Greek language is. <laughs> I better get away from that while I can. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, it's a good, it's a, a neat exercise in exegesis. And I'll say this, that our Lord has been very good to us in telling us precisely what we need to do to be saved. And we don't have to worry about uh, long-winded definitions and the like. Although he does encourage us to use our noodles by tossing out things like this. And uh, encouraging us to stretch our minds, and that's, that's good. But I'm sure glad that the things we need to be saved are written in language that anybody can understand. If, of course, he really wants to. Okay, well, by faith we understand that the ages were framed by the word of God. So the things which are seen are made up of things which cannot be seen. Now, here's somebody saying this almost 2,000 years ago when it took mankind almost all that long to come up with what it says. Uh, faith is practical. Faith is very practical. Amen. Amen. Uh, we read about Noah having been commissioned to build a great big box. And I'm glad God gave him the schematic. He sure would never have been able to figure it out how to do it on his own. And it took... Uh, ship builders to within my lifetime to come up to the proportions of the ark six to one the lusitania was seven to one the titanic was almost nine to one but the uss missouri on which the document was signed that ended world war ii six to one just like the ark it just makes good sense to take god at his word uh, shortly after the establishment of Israel as a modern state, an Israeli official of some kind got to wondering why the Bible says Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba. It's well known that the climate is too dry down there. Boy, it's almost as dry as Arizona, actually, uh, for anything like a tree to grow. But he took this literally and planted some tamarisk trees and the Israelis have a flourishing forestry industry down there where a tree is not supposed to be able to grow because God said something and somebody took him seriously. And we could get into the history of the medical profession. 
Oh my, how many countless thousands or millions of people could have had their lives saved if the doctors, even as recently as the Civil War, bothered to read the Law of Moses, what it says about public health and sanitation. There are far more men died of disease and of infection than were killed in battle back then. It pays to pay attention to what God says and found your belief upon it. So the chapter goes on. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet visible, in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, mm -hmm. by which he condemned the world. Mm -hmm. Now that's a neat thought to chase around. Elsewhere in Hebrews, remember, that we're told to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, and if you think that this means the emphasis on the ones that don't assemble, forget it. The emphasis is on the ones who do. By which, like Noah, condemned the world because he did what God asked him to do. Even so today we have the privilege, now this is not something to be happy about, but we have the privilege in obedience to God to condemn those who do not obey him. I like it a lot if they would get up there on Mount Ararat and dig that thing out of the ice and bring it down. It won't help my faith a bit. I think it's there. I think it's there because God put it there after the flood, but it would sure shut a lot of them mouthy types. I'd like that. And I'll bet you would too. Well, let's see. I have one or two more things to say. Uh, the Hebrew writer reminds us that Noah's obedience condemned the world. And I can imagine something that might have happened. When the water got knee deep, the neighbors might have come and hammered on the door of the ark and said, Man, Noah, you were right. Let us in. We don't like the prospect a bit. And Noah could say, I wish you'd paid attention to me when I was preaching righteousness to you. Mm -hmm. Besides that, it's not my decision. That's right. God shut the door. God will open it. Amen. Amen. Well, let's look at Abraham a bit. Bless his heart, even as you and I, he had to grow in faith and in grace. Uh, I'm, I'm refreshed by reading about some of our friends in Scripture who are obviously having more or less the same problems I've had over the years. He uh, stood on the high ground and said to his nephew Lot, Kid, see what looks good to you. Take whatever you want. Now, although he was the older, he, was the, he wasn't a patriarch yet, but he was working on it. And uh, he let Lot take his choice, which, of course, proved to be a bad choice. But anyway, this was gracious on Abraham's part. It was gracious when he stopped off at Salem and, in a sense, accepted second billing to Melchizedek. Now, this, of course, was by God's design. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, as reflecting Abraham's personal feelings, this was a gracious thing for him to do. And it's neat that we can call him the father of the faithful. Now let's look at the lady that we may consider the mother of the faithful since she was Abraham's wife. When the angels came to Abraham and announced that after all those years, the son of promise would be born, Sarah laughed. Some think she laughed in derision. I will defend to the death the view that she laughed because she was delighted that after all this time the promise would be fulfilled. And exactly how did the Lord do it? I can't tell you this for sure, but I'll tell you what I think happened. I think he cranked back the clock and restored her youth and Abraham along with her. Because you know what? Jane and I only have four grandkids, and we love them to distraction. 
But there comes a time when it's neat to see them departing in the car of their parents. <laughs> Somebody put it this way, as the twig is bent, the grandparents are bushed. <laughs> oh boy, think of being a mom and a dad at a time when your contemporaries are great-grandparents or maybe great-great-grandparents. It's just a practical matter to view this miracle that God worked as a setting back of the biological clock. Let's see, was this just in Arizona? Where did that lady, recently she was in the news, 63-year-old woman that got her doctors to do some hocus-pocus and she wound up with a baby girl. Well, there's a Tucson columnist that observed this. At least they can have one thing in common. The daughter wears pampers and mom wears depends. God loves it when his kids ask him for impossibilities. Amen. He absolutely loves it when we have enough trust in our God to say, Lord, please do this. We think it'll be good for the kingdom. And oh, how good he is to do this. By faith, Abel offered more sacrifice than Cain. Now, not more excellent. And I know I'm addressing some Bible college profs, and I may get into hot water here. But it wasn't the blood sacrifice that made Abel's offering superior to that of Cain. God hadn't set that rule down yet. And given you, in addressing Judge Hires eight years ago, said God does not expect obedience to a law he has not made. And I thank you for that. And I wish that there were some that paid more attention to what you said on that occasion. Anyway, it's, uh, it's not only not really practical to make laws where God hasn't made them. It may actually be dangerous. He may resent our stepping into his territory. My dad used to put it this way. There are two fields. God is, God's is legislation. Ours is obedience. And we have no business getting across the fence into God's territory. Absolutely not. Well, let's see. Back to Abel's offering. First, he brought the best. This is a faith offering because he showed his faith that God would help him get along as well or better on what was left than what would have been true had he used it all for himself. It demonstrated his conviction, his solid conviction, that this would be true. Uh, let's, let's never forget, God has always valued the attitude of the one who gives an offering more than he does the gift. Remember, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Sacrifice and offering you did not want, you opened my ears. With what shall I come to the Lord? Bow myself before the God on high. Thousands of rams, tens of thousands of rivers of oil. And then Micah got away from all that hyperbole. Boy, is it hyperbole. <laughs> to say, what does God require but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly before your God. And Abel did that, bless his heart for so doing. And by so doing, he being dead, yet speaks. Amen. My dad had a couple of delightful stories about a little girl on her way home from Sunday school and church who met in front of the courthouse the village atheist. Now this is a very old story, but I want you to respect it because my dad got a lot of his stories from C.R.L. Vauder while he and mom were musicians with the Vauder Evangelistic Party. And Vauder went to school to J.W. McGarvey, <laughs> which makes, if this is a McGarvey story, it's a good one. Anyway, of course, now, thanks to Charles Darwin, uh, actually, um, this, this book I was recommending, has some neat things about Charles Darwin as an old man. His friends usually found him reading the Bible. 
And he was really sorry that people had taken his youthful speculations and made a religion of them. Anyway, uh, there are a lot of village atheists, but th this is an old story where there's only one in this village. So a little girl's skipping along on her way home from Bible school and church, and the village atheist corners her and says, uh, What are you coming back from church? Do you really believe that stuff? That fish story about Jonah and the whale? Well, yes, she said, I believe it. Well, how can you be sure? Well, she said, someday when I go to heaven, I'm going to hunt up Jonah and I'm going to make him sit down and tell me all about it. And I can think of lots of little girls. That's exactly the way they would handle this. Well, the village atheist said, suppose, suppose Jonah isn't in heaven. Then she said, you ask him. <laughs> There's a somewhat more elevated version of this. It has the village atheist asking if she really believes that God took Enoch. He didn't have to die. Well, she said, I think it's simple. They were out walking and visiting, and when it got dark, they were closer to God's house, so that's where they went. Uh, maybe the theology is a little shaky, but that's a good story. Then our scribe asked us to remember the harlot Rahab, who uh, rescued the scouts that were investigating Jericho. And when the city was destroyed, her household were saved. And uh, bless her heart, you know the genealogy of our Lord lists four women. Amen. Four. Only four. And not an Israelite in a bunch. Right. There was Tamar of Canaanite, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba. What a neat thing it was God did for her. She was one of our Lord's grandmas. Because she had faith in him. Amen. Amen. And there's Gideon, among others mentioned in this chapter. And our scribe of Hebrews whoever it was, <laughs> we're not going to get into that, says that he didn't have time to discuss them all, neither do I. But uh, Gideon learned a few things. His faith grew. Uh, I, I can picture what might have happened in that famous story of the fleece. That uh, Gideon's thinking, suppose one of my buddies overheard my visit with the Lord, and he poured a gourd full of water on that fleece well his faith grew his trust in God grew even as yours and mine must grow and uh, when the fleece is sopping wet and all around it is Arizona dry <laughs> that's impressive and it's even more impressive when all around it is sopping wet and the fleece is Arizona dry incidentally I'm really not comfortable wearing this coat. I haven't worn one since we got down to Green Valley, Arizona. Well, anyway. Uh, I have a good friend in Denver, J.H. Schroeder. He's pretty smart in spite of the fact that he's not chronologically advantaged like some of us are. But uh, he has some good friends who are Jewish Christians. And uh, one of them, in fact, is a rabbi. And uh, one of the, the rabbi told J.H., who told me, that there is no word in Hebrew for faith as we think of it. Rather, the word is trust. Trust. And uh, I'm inevitably reminded of a story I'm sure some of you have heard, maybe all of you have heard it. I don't know. I don't care. I'm going to tell it anyway about the aerialist, the guy that strung the tight wire between a couple of buildings downtown for a civic holiday. And first he walked across and back, and then he rode a bicycle with no tires on it, across and back. And then he had a wheelbarrow with a flanged wheel instead of a tire. He was visiting with the mayor who was up there, do you think I can do this? Do you believe I can push this across and back? Well, yes, from what I've seen, I believe you can. Would you like to ride in the wheelbarrow? 
that's uh, that's where the where the rubber meets the road. That's where we stop talking and start walking. If we have that kind of trust in our God, then believing 2,000 years ahead of its time that what is seen is made up of things that can't be seen, molecular structure, that's nothing. It has to do with now. And our faith, our trust in God has to do with eternity. And uh, let me share with you my dad's definition of faith. Faith is to walk as far as we can see. And then because God asks us of it, asks us of it, take one more step. Faith is the foundation, the undertaking of things hoped for. It is our means of proving unseen realities. Thank you for letting me share with you today. Amen.